It's kind of the beauty of worshiping how where we're at. Thank you, Dan, for leading us to pray for whatever crisis is happening here that wouldn't have happened within four walls. We wouldn't have known about it. Um, so we go to the message and um, wanted to share with you. If you've been, if you're in my small group, you already know this, but like our family, we drink coffee. I don't, but we drink a little coffee, but we're tea drinkers. We drink a lot of tea. And if you're in my small group, you know, we've got the tea cart there with the kettle and, you know, usually 20 to 30 different types of teas out and you can pick what you like and you can have cream and sugar or no cream and sugar or whatever. But we drink a lot of tea and, um, and it's funny because there's two types of tea drinkers. Now, when, when I tell you this, now you're going to notice it when you see somebody make a cup of tea. But there's two types of tea drinkers. There's dippers and there's steepers, okay? There's dippers and there's steepers. And, and some people, they don't like a real strong cup of tea. They want to take and they just kind of want to dip, dip, dip. And then when it gets the color they like, then, then they throw the tea bag away, you know? Or you'll see them take the string and wrap it around the spoon like they're fancy. And, you know, those are the dippers. Now, I don't, I don't have to do that because I'm a steeper. But I'm not just a steeper. I'm a special kind of steeper. I leave my tea bag in the tea. I put the hottest water I can. I put the tea bag first. I put the tea bag before the water. And then I put the hot water as hot as I can get. And then I let it steep, not just until it's drinkable. I start drinking it when it starts to cool off, but I will leave it until the very last sip. And then it all gross you out because my son and I both like to then take the tea bag and suck the last little bit of tea out of the tea bag. But we both do that. Um, you know, but I think, I think Annalise is a steeper too, but she doesn't, that last step is just a little too far. But, but, but I want that tea to be as strong as possible. And that last sip, that last sip, that's just, that's just the best. It's like the strongest sip. It's like the best. It's what you, it's what you wait, are waiting for, the whole, the whole tea, right, as you go through it. Well, we're talking about courage today, and when we talk about courage, we want the same thing. We want that, we want that courage steeped strong. Okay, in fact, courage sort of means strong or means strength in a sense. Now, I want to I want to read to you this morning from it's a second temple text, which means that it's a late it's written later than the Old Testament and it's written earlier than the New Testament. So it's between the testaments. It's not in your Bible. It's from a collection of Jewish writings that we call the Apocrypha. And the Apocrypha are important. They're not the scriptures. They're not the inspired word of God, but they're important because they tell us the way that people were thinking coming into the New Testament times. Okay? And especially all of, the, all of the disciples, all of the early, early disciples, the first Christians, they were all Jewish. And these were important things to them that, that, told them, that, that inspired what they then believed about the Messiah, believed about Christ. So this text comes from the Wisdom of Solomon, Chapter 8, verse 7, and here the author writes, If anyone loves to do what is right, laboring with wisdom will produce every virtue. She teaches them, by she it means wisdom, wisdom teaches them what is right and how to exercise courage. Nothing is more advantageous than these when it comes to human existence. Nothing is more advantageous than courage. So the first thing I want you to notice in this text is that they are calling courage a virtue, a virtue. And that means, because here's how we tend to think about courage. We think about courage like some people are courageous, some people aren't. Like it's, like it's a personality trait, okay? Like it's just something that some people have and other people don't. And that's how we tend to think about courage. But here the, in the Wisdom of Solomon, they're saying, no, 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 hang on a second, it's not just something some people have and some people don't. It's a virtue. And if it's a virtue, it's something that you pursue. It's something that you want for your life. And, and, and in fact, as we go through this, you're going to find out that it's something you need for your life, especially as a follower of Jesus. You need courage. That it's not just something that's laid before us. It's a virtue. In fact, we might define it as strength. Well, it's a sort of a raw definition of courage. is strength in the face of pain or grief. But we might even define it as strength to stand up for what is right in the face of pain or grief. Or when, when life is hard, that you continue to go after what's right and good, even when it's hard. So I think of the tea again. 
And like, I'm thinking about where courage comes from. And I think that we get strong courage in the same way that we get a strong cup of tea. That if you're just going to kind of dip, you're going to have a kind of a weak courage. You're not going to have a lot of courage. You're going to be weak. But if you're going to really steep, then you're going to get strong. Well, steep in what? Well, I think there's three things that we see repeatedly throughout the scriptures that are going to influence our ability to have strength, to have courage. Those three things are the scriptures, prayer, and our endurance in trials. Okay? Scripture, prayer, and our endurance in trials. And, and so, like, if you think about the scriptures, like the person who's just dipping, that's only kind of getting a little scriptures. Maybe you're getting it on Sundays when you come to church, but not really any other time. Or maybe, maybe you're getting like a verse of the day in your Instagram or something like that, but you're not, but you're not like sitting down to really read longer texts of scripture or to study deeply the meaning of scripture, right? You're just kind of dipping. You're just kind of getting a little here and there wherever you get it. And you're going to have a nice, light, fruity cup of tea, right? But you're not going to have a deep, strong, rich understanding of the scriptures. I think, I think of prayer also. Many Christians are going are gonna to think about prayer um, as, as like an occasional thing. That when you pray, you pray when there's a need, you pray when there's a reason to pray, you pray at church. You're kind of dipping. Wherever there's, a, wherever there's a need to dip into prayer, you dip into prayer. But the person with, with, with strength of courage is the person who's steeped in prayer. The person who's saturated in prayer. That, that takes seriously Paul's charge to pray without ceasing. To always be about prayer. To be in your day, going through life, moment by moment, hour through hour, day by day, as if Christ were with you, because he is. To just know that he's with you all the time, so that in everything you pray. And as if a, a friend walking beside you, that whatever happens in life, you go, man, did you see this, Jesus? That's what it means to pray continually. To just always have this awareness of the Lord with you and to be talking to him throughout your day. And I think of how we deal with trials. And, and this is our Lent connection, by the way, as we're in, I don't know, what are we, the fourth week of Lent. This idea that, like, courage becomes a sacrificial thing. Because when you, when you have trials that come into your life, challenges that come into your life, and whatever types of challenges they are, we've talked about that weeks past it, how are you dealing with them? Are you running from them? Are you, are you just hiding inside yourself, pretending that things are just fine and you're, not, you're just not going to deal with them? You're just running from them? You deal with it in the little instances, the moments when you have to. You dip into those trials, but you, but you try to be hands off. You're just trying to wait it out, see if this trial is going to pass. Or do you take seriously what Scripture teaches about trials, that trials are there for your formation, and then you lean into them, you take them seriously, you, you take it with, with Scripture and with prayer, and you go into it and you deal with the issues, you persevere through it with the Lord right there by your side so that you then grow and develop from it. That's how you get steeped in and you become strong, become a man or a woman of courage because you're steeped in the scriptures and you're steeped in prayer and you're saturated in this endurance through trials. And when you get that, it's going to benefit you in amazing ways. Look, look back at that passage from Wisdom of Solomon. He says, Nothing is more advantageous than courage when it comes to human existence. Nothing will benefit you more than this. And he's, he's saying that there is no greater virtue in a sense than courage. And I think that's a bold claim. We talked about um, uh, prudence as the, not, I'm sorry, temperance as the chief of all virtues, the chief virtue of all virtues. Um, but here the wisdom of Solomon, he's just saying, this is a really important element of your faith as a follower of God. Because it affects your very existence as a human being. It affects all of your life. Being a courage person. 
If you actually look at, and I don't have this in your slides, but if you look at Wisdom 8.6, the author says, who could possibly be wiser than the one who designed everything that is? And he's remembering that you, as a human being, are created in the image of God, that, that, that we have this great God who is over all things. He's created all things. He's designed all things. He's breathed life into human beings so that we live, and we live in his image and after his likeness. And, and, and what he's saying here is that, in a sense, there's no one more courageous than God. There's no one with greater strength than God. And if you are created in his image, then walk in his likeness. There will be nothing better for you in this life than to be like God, to be in his strength. And so courage is a virtue that's immediately helpful for how we navigate this life. And so the person who is, who is weak, that it is fearful, that's just kind of dipped in, dipped in the church, dipped in the, dipped in the scriptures, just kind, of, just kind of has a hint of prayer in their life, just, just has a hint of what it means to walk with Christ, but isn't really getting saturated in it, that person is gonna, isn't, isn't going to have the courage to understand how to navigate the world. To stand up for what is right and to stand against what is wrong. And you face decisions and you don't know how to handle them because you don't have that strength in you. And so often when we speak of courage, there's, I, think, I think there's one obvious text. Let's, let's see, where are my Bible geeks out there? If you're going to go to the Bible and you're going to talk about courage, can anybody tell me where they go? Who said it? Joshua. That was Lorelai. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, my, you know, what are you going to do? Anyway, yeah, Joshua is like the obvious place. It's like the first example of a challenge to God's people to be courageous. So here, here's the context. So Moses, as you probably know, did not get to bring the Israelites into the promised land. So after they have gone through 40 years in the wilderness, Moses actually dies just before entering the promised land. There's a whole reason for that. So the, the nation then gets handed over to Joshua, who is, who's, who's Moses' right-hand man. And it's going to be Joshua's job to bring the Israelites into the land. And so here's what happens right at the top of Joshua chapter 1. It says this, and we got about nine verses, so here's a section to read. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, uh, Yahweh said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan River, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given it to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness of, and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the U, river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea, towards the going down of the sun, shall be your territory." No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all that the law of Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or the left, that you may have good success wherever it is that you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. You shall be steeped in the law of God, saturated in it, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for Yahweh your God is with you wherever you go. That's the, that's the courage passage in the scripture. And it just goes forward from there throughout the narrative. But, but here's what we see, that the Israelites, they were going to need courage. They were going to need strength, strength and constitution of self. To be able to stand up and go into the land and take the land. Now, there's, there's some controversial things that are happening here in Joshua. Um, we call this series of narratives in Joshua, this series of stories, we call them the conquest narratives. Because they're commanded to go in and effectively wipe out all the people in the promised land. And some people take some, have some ethical concerns with that. 
And so I want to I help you with this and why this is supposed to happen. Um, the, we, can, we can tell from looking back all the way as far as Abraham that the people in this land, primarily tribes of Canaanites, but then you've got Hittites and, 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 you, and you've got some Philistines there, you've got some other groups there, but the people in this land have already been condemned for their wickedness. And when you read the Old Testament broadly, you, fi you find a pattern that when God is going to punish an entire group of people, an entire nation, let's say, he does that by bringing in another nation. You can actually see this happen over and over in the book of Judges. That when Israel, which is the book after Joshua, Joshua by the way, so when Israel is disobedient towards Yahweh and they go and they worship false gods, then the Philistines rise up and they, and they enslave them. It happens in what we call the exile. Babylon and Edom and Assyria rise up to take the Israelites out of the promised land and take them into exile. That God uses other nations to punish nations. And that's precisely what's happening here in Joshua. Is he's using Israel to carry out his, uh, to carry out his punishment or his judgment upon the people of this land um, that he is then going to give over to the Israelites. Now there's, there's, there's some fun stuff in here if you, if you want, want to look into this on your own. Um, we're going to see that there's, actually, that there's actually giants in the land. And if you go back to Exodus and back to the time when, when they were condemned to 40 years of wandering into the wilderness, it was because of a lack of faith. Because when they went and they spied out the land, the spies came back, all but Joshua and Caleb came back crying, there's giants in the land, we're going to die if we go in. Can't we go back to, to Egypt and be slaves but have onions and stuff like that? Like They go back crying because they don't want to go in and fight the giants. The, the, sons of the, uh, the sons of the Anakim and are, are there in the land. And so there's, there's reason to be afraid. There's reasons to be, a reason to be afraid except for the Lord our God is with us. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Um, now I think this is interesting because he's saying, look, it's going to be scary, but be courageous. And... I don't know if I, would, if, if I would ever classify courage as an emotion. But I think that we categorize courage kind of like we do emotions, right? Like, like if you're being fearful and someone goes, come on, be courageous. You kind of feel like, but I'm not, I'm fearful. Like, I can't help how I feel, right? And that's how it is. Like, like if you're mad and, you know, and you're just you're just steaming mad and somebody goes well just don't be mad stop being mad it's like I might okay, okay. now uh, you should have if you're you know if you're sanctified right you should be able to control how you deal with your mad but it's hard, but but you can't just really just not be mad in the moment right now you might be able to pray and meditate on scripture and and bring that emotion down, but it's not a light swish, right? It's not, like, it's not like you're washing the dishes and somebody says, don't wash the dishes, and you go, okay, and you just put them down. That's not how emotions work. You can't just turn them on and off. If you're sad, the worst thing that somebody can say to you is, don't be sad, right? It's like, get away from me. Like, <laughs> like I have every, especially if you have every reason to be sad. Right? It's like, get away from me, right? Um, now, in your sadness, don't sin, but you, but you might be sad, right? You can control how you act when you're sad, but it's hard. you really can't just turn off the sad. And we tend to think of courage that way, right? Like, like, like you either are or you're not, and you can't turn it on and off. But looking back in the text, I don't think that's actually true. Let's, let's take, take a look back. He says, only be strong and very courageous. So first of all, he is commanding them, be strong and courageous. Okay? Tell me then, Joshua, how do I turn this thing on? Being careful to do according to all that the law of Moses, my servant, commanded you. Being careful to do. Now, can you do that? Can you get steeped 
in Scripture so that you understand what is the will of God and then do it. Is that practical? Can you do that? The answer is yes, and that's how you turn it on. You get steeped in the law of God. You get steeped, as we talked, in the Spirit of God that wrote the Scriptures. You get steeped in the trial and you understand its purpose that we have learned from the Spirit in the Scriptures. We get steeped in it. And so, yeah, courage is not an emotion. It really isn't. It really is something that you can do, that you can get into the Scriptures and into the will and purpose of God, and you can therefore stand firm in the day of trial. Courage for Israel was enacted by keeping God's law. And in this, that means that courage, listen, courage is an act of faith. That whenever you walk in faith, whenever, whenever you have an action, an activity of faith, that is a step of courage. That when you know what it means to walk with Christ, and you stand firm, and you do what is, cha- what is commanded of you according to the scriptures, then that is courage. And when you don't, then, then it's not courage. In fact, sometimes our courage is sapped. We kind of, we lose our courage. And there's, there's an interesting um, story in Joshua about that. If you look at Joshua 2.11, now, I want to give you some context for this. So this is just into the conquest narr- narrative, and they're coming up on their first city, and this is the city of Jericho. Fortified walls, big armies. These are strong people, right? But something has happened um, back in Torah when Moses was still leading the Israelites. And word of these things has gotten to the city of Jericho. And that's what we're going to read about here in Joshua 2.11. So it says, as soon as we heard it, and the we there is the people of Jericho, um, and the it is the pillaging of Pharaoh and his armies at the Red Sea. It's the defeat of two giant kings on the outside, uh, over, over, over in what like is modern day Syria, on the other side of the Jordan River, named Son, si, uh, Sihon and Og. These were giant kings who were, who, were, who were defeated by the Israelites. These were supposed to be undefeatable kingdoms. Great kingdoms. And they have fallen at the hands of the Israelites. And Egypt has fallen at the hand of the Israelites. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. That phrase, no spirit left in any man, that's a euphemism in Hebrew that means that they lost all courage. That they had no courage. They were internally defeated. You ever, you ever felt that way? You ever, you ever like failed at something and just internally felt completely defeated? Imagine feeling like that. Feeling like your, your country, Jericho, your nation, your city, is going to be defeated. That this foreign army is going to come in and they're going to kill everybody. And there's nothing you can do. And then here comes your general and he's calling the troops and he wants all able men to come and to fight. And he puts a sword in your hands and he puts you on the front line and he says, okay, go fight. And you're just already in heart defeat. It doesn't matter how big your muscles are or how much training you had. You are already, you have committed to defeat in your heart. And there's something about victory, you get this in the movie Braveheart, there's something about when victory comes into your heart that brings victory in reality. And when defeat has come into your heart and mind, then it doesn't matter what strength lies in the physical world, you will be defeated. And that's what's happened here is they they lost all courage because they heard that Yahweh was with them. It says, because of you, for the Lord, your God, Yahweh, your God, he is God in the heavens above and on earth below. That's what they heard. That That when the world's greatest powers, Egypt, Sihon, Og, fell at the hands of the Israelites, They didn't say, look how great Israel is. They said, surely their God is God of gods. He is higher. He's God of heaven and earth. That's a a way of recognizing him as as, as not just the God of of the spiritual world and the God of the physical world, but that's a way of saying he's creator. 
He's the supreme. He's the highest. He's the one who all other beings in the world and in the spirit world are subject to. He is God in the heavens and our earth beneath. And as a quick side note there, that should create a hyperlink to the Great Commission when Jesus says, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. That should create a hyperlink where you go, oh, that means Jesus is the God who all nations quake at his name. That he's the one who has that kind of power. And you should go, yeah, and he's on my side because I'm on his side. Rahab and her family, um, uh, I didn't introduce Rahab, did I? Rahab is, uh, and her family, they're, Rahab's a prostitute who um, has a family there. They live in the city walls. And when they heard that Israel was coming and they believed in who Yahweh was. That's important. They, they weren't afraid of Israel so much as they revered Yahweh, the God of Israel. That's what it says in the text. For the Lord God, he is God of heavens and earth above. That's what they said. And so Rahab and her family, they actually lost faith in their gods and in their kings, because they heard about Yahweh. That means that, that means that they knew that their city was going to fall. Their city was going to be defeated. And because they, because they no longer had this trust, they just had this instant sense of defeat. That's why it says that our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man. They just couldn't, they knew that they were not going to last if they stuck with Jericho and with Jericho's gods. And when you fear to the point that you can't trust God, you will not be able to have courage. That when you look at, I don't care what it is, when you look at like political f affairs in the world, and, and there's all kinds of things being said. What, what if something happens and the United States government is overthrown and some other country, maybe China or some other country, comes in and occupies the United States and radically changes our society so that we become socialist or communist? What if Christianity becomes illegal? And what, what if? What if all of that happens? Rahab says, so what? Right? What if that happens? You have the choice to stand and say, so what? Christ is God in heaven and above the earth. He's, he's God. He's king. He's there. He's Lord over all things. You can stand and say, so what? Or you can let that fear seep into your heart so that your heart melts and there's no spirit left in you. And instead of standing in that day, you fold. And you lose your courage. And you just fold in. You just fold into however society, I guess this isn't a Christian world anymore. And you just fold into society the other way it goes. Fear will rob your courage if you do not trust in God. But there's hope in this story because as the story progresses, you know what actually happens is Rahab and her family, because they know who Yahweh is, they, they go, they go to, they go, there's a whole story, you should go read it, Joshua 2. They hide some spies from Israel that come in to the land. They want to check it out. And so they come in and they hide them from the government so that the spies can go back and report back to the Israelite commanders and all of that. And it's an act of faith because what Rahab is doing here is she's, she's believing in Yahweh and she's pledging allegiance. She's giving her allegiance to Yahweh. Immediately after she hides the, the Israelite spies, she lies to the, her own government about them. She's, she no longer has loyalty to, to, to her own government. She has loyalty to Yahweh only. And Rahab, actually, it's, it's a really cool story. Rahab ends up coming into Israel. She becomes an Israelite, her and her whole family. And she actually becomes the, like the great-grandmother of King David. This pagan woman comes into Israel by faith in Yahweh and... Ultimately, if she's the great grand or the grandmother of David, that means she's the great 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 grandmother of Jesus. She becomes a very important character in the story of Christ Himself. 
And it starts here with this immense act of faith. She had this courage. She didn't fear her own government because now she knew Yahweh was with her. Didn't, government didn't matter anymore. And that's the beauty is if you do trust God, then it doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter if you live in a city full of enemies. If you do trust in God, you will have courage. You'll be courageous. And courage for the Christian, it's not, you have to understand, it's not merely this kind of stoic virtue, like, like you're just like this like stoic character, like, like the warrior. Like if you picture like a Norseman, you know, or something like that, if you've watched like Vikings or something like those shows, or you've read the mythologies, which I haven't, I've just seen the shows. But anyway, you, you get this picture of like these, this like burly, muscular Norsemen that it doesn't matter. Just one guy with a half a sword is going to go and attack a whole army. And he's just got that kind of courage, right? But it's not just that kind of courage. It's not just that ability to stand strong. It's actually based on our faith in the presence of Christ. Remember there in the text, it was because Yahweh was with them in Joshua that they could stand. It was because they had a sense of God with them that they could stand. So it's not a grin and bear it attitude that we're supposed to have. Like when I tell you to be courageous, I'm not talking about mustering your own strength. I'm not talking about you, you internalizing or suppressing your fears. Right? I'm actually talking about, remember we used the T analogy, steeping yourself in the scriptures and in prayer. It's It's a positive activity, not a negative activity. It's not suppressing the fear, it's getting to know the presence of Christ that gives you the courage. That's really what the Christian virtue is. It's more of a natural attitude that expects to see victory in every opportunity. Right? So that, so that even before adversity rises up, any kind of adversity, you, go, you, you might go into work tomorrow and be handed a pink slip. You might get a, you might get, you might get a notice in the mail from, from your landlord that your rent's going up. You might have a doctor's appointment this week that you're going to get really bad news. I, I, it doesn't matter what the adversity is. You might have a family member betray you. You might have a friend. It, whatever adversity. We could have a law passed that changes the way that we live. Our, it doesn't matter. Whatever type of adversity, we're looking forward. We know the adversity is coming, and we laugh in the face of it because we know that our God is higher. That you, that you have this expectation that in every opposition, you will see victory. That's courage. And so it might be helpful to express this idea by looking at the opposite of courage. I like to look at opposites and try to look at things backwards to see if we can work that out. So um, the opposite of courage, I'm actually going to read from the Apocrypha again. I don't normally read from the Apocrypha ever, none less twice in a message, but here we are. Um, And again, not the scriptures, but allowing us to understand that the way that the New Testament Christians were thinking. So Sirach 2, 12 and 13 says, how terrible it will be for cowardly hearts and idle hands and for a sinner who sets foot upon two paths. How terrible it will be for the timid heart because it doesn't trust. Therefore, it won't be protected. What I see in here is that the opposite of courage is cowardice. The opposite of strength is weakness. And he's saying, look, it's going to be terrible when adversity comes... It will be terrible for you if you are cowardly. How terrible it will be for the timid of heart who doesn't trust in God and therefore won't be protected by him. Cowards are actually, cowards are hypocrites. In this way, cowards live one way and say another thing. And so today is a good day, and it's a beautiful day. And we have every reason this morning to hope in Christ. And so it's easy for you as a Christian to be gathered here and to, and, and to sing songs of worship and to, and, and to be thankful for the grace of God in our lives. And, 
and to give thanks to him and to say, here in the safety of our church body, to say that Christ is king over all. But then what if that adversity does happen? What if you go into work tomorrow with your understanding of your good Christian ethics and good business practices and your boss comes to you and says, hey, we had this problem come down. I want you to redo this paperwork and put this other thing on it so that we can pass this inspection or something like that. They want you to falsify documents. And you say, no, I'm an honest person in Christ. And you say, I don't want to do that because I'm an honest person. And he says, you can do it or you can go home and somebody else will do it. And you have to decide, do I, do I stand in the face of adversity on my principles, what I have said, I am an honest person, but if you are weak, if you are cowardly, if you, fear, if you fear man more than you fear God, then you're going to compromise your ethics that you profess. You're going to say you're honest and you are going to commit dishonesty. And that's just one illustration of a million things that could happen tomorrow. A million different things could happen tomorrow where your faith could be tested and you are going to have to decide, am I honest? Am I faithful? Am I generous? Am I compassionate? Am I, you fill in whatever virtue. Will I stand with the God above heaven and earth or will I compromise? Will I become cowardly and a hypocrite? And the reality is, is you don't really know who you are until you're faced with adversity. You don't know till that happens if you're a coward or if you're courageous. You just don't know. But I'll tell you this, you can always be more courageous. You can always be getting into more. You can always get back in the scriptures. You can always get seeped in it. You can always, you can always pray more. You can always, you can always get more into who God is, learn him more, get to know him better. Cowardice is, um, cowardice is huge. Um, we don't tend to talk about this a lot as Protestants, although it does exist in the Protestant kind of canon of literature, but um, the, there's a fairly historic idea of venial and mortal sins. I don't know if you've ever heard this before. But this comes from the history of the church. Yeah, it's, I, Jamie mouthed Catholic. It's, it's talked about mostly in Catholic circles today, but I actually think it's kind of interesting. Because what, the, what the, the scholars who are doing is they're looking at the ethics of the scriptures and they're trying to answer questions about how do we think about different sins in the practical sphere, right? So, for example, in the book of 1 Corinthians, this issue arises where there's a man in unrepentant and vile sexual immorality, and they're just allowing him in the church to just continue to be a part of the church, even though he's in not just unrepentant sin, but really horrible sin. And Paul says to cast him out to the devil. He said, like, get that guy out of the church. He cannot be a part of the church if he's living that way, if he won't repent. Now, there's, if you repent of your sins, you're welcome. Like, ever, everybody's welcome. But there are certain sins that mean we cannot identify with you as the church until you come to repentance. But then other things aren't that way. Like, if somebody comes to me or one of our elders and says, hey, I'm really struggling with anger at home. I keep yelling at my wife or I keep yelling at my kids or, you know, I kicked the dog or whatever. We're going to say, okay, we want to... We want to walk through that with you. Let's, we're going to bring you into counsel, into prayer, and, and to help you come to repentance on your sin. We're not going to say if you don't repent, you're excommunicated, right? But like, if you're cheating on your spouse, and you're found out, and you say, well, I don't care, then we're going to have a question about your involvement in the church. Right? It's, so there's, there's what is called a venial sin, that is like the, the, the weakness of the human flesh um, that is challenging your union with God, but doesn't mean that you're not united to God. 
And then you have mortal sins that are an intentional turning away from God. That's the mortal sin. The mortal sin is the sin that, you, that, that when you commit that sin, everybody knows that person turned their back on Christ when he committed that sin. They're the things that are premeditated, right? Murder is premeditated. Adultery is premeditated. And apparently, cowardice is a mortal sin. Um, and that's basically what we see, we see there in Sirach. Um, it's something that separates you from God. And there's a natural ordering to this. Because cowards lack courage. If we understand what courage is, cowards lack courage because they lack trust in God. Remember, courage comes from being steeped in who God is in the scriptures and in the spirit and in prayer. And, therefore, and so we have this great trust for God that allows us to stand in courage. But to be a coward is to lack trust in God. In other words, it's to lack faith. It's not to really be loyal to him. I like some of his ideas of righteousness, but I am not loyal. And we've talked about this, that the hinge pin of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that coming to faith in Jesus Christ, that you are not a Christian if Jesus is not your king. Right? That that is the hinge pin. It's why he's called the Lord Jesus Christ all over the New Testament. It's why we use the word Lord for God in the Old Testament. That he must be Lord. He must be master. He must be king. And if he is not that, then you are not his. And so cowardice, this hypocrisy, is, is merely just an expression that you're not really in Christ in the first place. That you're not in his kingdom. You're not actually one of his. And so we need this trust in Christ. We, we, we need to have this kind of courage because it says something about who we are and what we believe. We need to trust in Christ as our source for all courage. Look at Romans 1.16. This is where we're really getting into what, what the New Testament teaches. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Look, that word ashamed... I don't, I don't know how much preaching you've heard on this verse, but that word ashamed doesn't mean embarrassed. Um, if you are embarrassed to tell somebody that you're a Christian or that you go to church or that you're a follower of Jesus, if you're embarrassed about that, that might be a bigger problem than what Paul's talking about. Listen, Paul is living in a world and remembering who Paul is, right? Paul's living in a world where you can be killed for being a Christian. Uh, mostly just for being an outspoken Christian. But, like, literally, Paul was at the head of the stoning of Stephen before he became a Christian. So when he was a Jew and he was persecuting the Christians, he actually instigated, the, effectively, the murder of, of St. Stephen, the first martyr in the scriptures. Okay? This guy knows the cost of following Jesus because he has instigated it. And now he's come to Christ and he's made, he says these words, I am not ashamed of the gospel. He doesn't mean embarrassment. He means that he will not be disgraced, confounded, dishonored because of the gospel. That, that Paul will stand firm, that he will speak boldly, that he will proclaim the glories of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That he will not look at the society and he will not, he's not going to pander and say, if I proclaim Christ here, then I might be killed. That's what he, that's what he means by ashamed. He means that he's going to stand firm. He's going to be courageous. Look, we don't even live in that kind of world. The fact that we're worried about, about somebody laughing at us for being a Christian just shows the comforts of the world that we live in. That word ashamed means something completely different to us today than it did to him then. And yet he was not even ashamed on that level. He would not be confounded. Why? Because of the power because of the courage, because of the strength of the gospel of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Paul is eager to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ because that is where we get the courage for faith. Faith that results in salvation. If you go on in the text, and it's not in your slides, but he says in verse 17 that the gospel is revealed from faith for faith. 
And this is this really cool play on words. Paul does this every now and then. Lots of the biblical authors do this kind of thing. But he's saying, from faith, for faith. From faith, for faith. So from the faith of those who proclaimed the gospel to him, for the benefit of his faith. That's what he means. That this is how the gospel progresses. This is the power of it. Is that when the gospel really does come into you, it inevitably comes out of you. It is the nature of the thing. That if the gospel of Jesus Christ transforms you, then the gospel message is going to come out of you to other people. It's inevitable. It's the nature of it. And so you received the gospel because of someone else's faith. That produces courage in you. So that you're, you're not ashamed of the gospel because it has transformed you. You now trust in Christ. And you know that if you're going to share the gospel with something, that there's absolutely nothing that can happen that will take you away from Christ. There's nothing to fear. And so it produces courage in you as you trust in Christ. And that courage, then it, it makes you look at hostility towards Christ and the church. You think, you, again, you think you look at politics, you look at social issues and things like that. And you look at it and you go, you know what? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I will not be confounded or disgraced by it. I'll speak. I will stand firm in my faith and I will share the gospel with others so that they receive faith. You know, they say that you are saved to what you are saved by. You are saved to what you are saved by. And I think when you have this kind of courageous faith, that you're willing to stand up in the face of adversity and proclaim the goodness of Christ to other people, that when somebody comes to faith in that setting, that they're going to that they're going to come with an expectation that they're going to receive that same courageous heart that they're going to receive that same courage that same boldness we've got too many christians who just who just really just going to kind of come to church i'm just kind of going to i'm going to try to be a good person that are that that are they're dipped tea okay dipped tea christians who don't have courage, who don't have boldness, who are ashamed of the gospel. And even if you get an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody, they're only going to be saved to what they are saved by. You're inviting them to dipped tea Christianity. And that's not what we see anywhere in the scriptures. Every single one of the disciples are bold, unashamed of the gospel, not able to be disgraced or confounded like Paul. They're strong in the Holy Spirit. And they go and they proclaim. And people hear. And they're transformed. And they're changed. And then they take the message of the gospel and they go out and they boldly, how do you think the Christianity has nearly spanned the entire globe because of bold, courageous Christians? You want your friends, your family, your neighbors, your co-workers to be saved? This is necessary. This is a primary virtue to be courageous, to stand firm in your faith. Courage in Joshua's day, look, it was to establish the nation of Israel, to establish God's people in the promised land, God's kingdom. And, and, and honestly, it's no different today. You need the same courage that Joshua commanded because you're doing the same work. You are establishing and gathering God's people for God's eternal kingdom, for the promised land that is to come. You're doing the same work. It's not cour Courageousness is just as necessary today as it has ever been in history. The church stands on your courage to go and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we're coming up on a pinnacle festival of the church. Easter. This pinnacle moment in Christian history... When, when not, just, not just the religion, but, our, but the world changed. The entire world changed when Jesus rose from the dead. And this is, this is an opportunity. Look, because I realize, you might be sitting there and going, yeah, Anthony, I hear you. I, I'm, 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 I want to go proclaim the gospel. I'm not really sure how. Let's do it. Okay. You're coming up on this moment 
where you can be certain that the central theme of Sunday's service, including the sermon, is going to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. That, that it is going to be a call to salvation. To allegiance to Jesus. Okay? You can be certain that's going to happen in virtually every church on the planet on Easter Sunday. And so, you have friends. You have family. You have neighbors. You have co-workers. You have other acquaintances that you would like to come to know Jesus Christ. That you think they don't know him. And you probably have good reasons for that. Either the way they live, they don't go to church, whatever it is. And you want them to know Jesus. Here's the thing with that. I don't know your friends. I don't know your family. I don't know your coworkers. I don't know your neighbors. I mean, some of them. But anyway, probably some of them. But you do. And the Great Commission... All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples was not given to me. It was given to the church. And this is why we emphasize this. That the church isn't like the pastors and the elders, the leadership. That's not the church. You are the church. You are the church. This is your work. Ephesians 4.12 says that your pastors, your shepherds were given to you in order to quick, equip you for the work of the ministry. And so this is me. I'm sending you to go to them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, it, and, and, and at this time, at this very moment, it literally cannot be easier. Because I'm not even telling you, okay, I want you to go and I want you to sit down and have this conversation. And you know, I'm not even telling you that. I'm just telling you to bring them to church on Sunday on Easter Sunday. That's all I'm telling you to do. That's all you're responsible for in this very moment. As I mean, obviously, if you have an opportunity to share Christ with your loved ones, please do it in that moment. Call them to submit to Christ as King. Absolutely do that every opportunity you have. But bring them to church on Easter Sunday. We, we print flyers usually and hand them out. We'll probably have them next week or something. And you guys take them to your friends and family. But I've been around church a long time, and almost every church does that, every Easter. And I just wonder how many of those make it into hands as actual invite. I'm not saying go stick them in people's doors. I'm saying go say, hey, you are my relative and I love you. You are my friend and I love you. You are my coworker and I care about your soul. Will you come hear this message? Oh, uh, I'm not really a Christian. It's not my thing. I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm asking if you would come here. You, you don't need to be a Christian to come to church. Just come here. Come with me. I'll, sit, I'll bring you a chair, right? And then you've got to go buy a couple of camping chairs. Anyway, I'll bring you a chair, right? And we'll have chairs. You know, we, always, we have even more than that. We'll have extras. Don't worry. I'll bring you a chair. Sit with me. Ask me if you have questions. Bring them. Your friends, your family are not going to come because I invite them. It's your work to do. It's on your shoulders. You need to bring them. It is your responsibility as a follower of Jesus. And if it scares you to tell people about your faith, and you're, you're sitting, you're listening, you're like, I know he's right, and I know the people I need to invite, and you're just terrified. You're like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. How am I going to start this conversation? Which, first of all, it's easy. You say, hey, friend, uh, I'd like you to come to church with me on Sunday. It's, it's pretty much that easy. But anyway, if you're scared, and you don't want to do that, Hebrews 13, 6. This is where I'm going to leave you. Write this verse down. If, you are, if you're that person, if you're like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. The author of Hebrews says, we can confidently, we can courageously say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Are you afraid your friends are going to laugh at you? Come on. Eternity is on the table. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you thankful for your word. 
And we pray first and foremost that you would steep us, saturate us in the scriptures and in by your spirit, by prayer. That we would be courageous men and women of God. That we would stand firm in the day of trial. That nothing would cause us to fear. That we would be bold. That we wouldn't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we would step confidently, courageously into the battle to bring your kingdom into the land. Lord, you are our helper. We will not fear. For man can do nothing to us to take us away from your promises. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.